Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, uh, Lord, let it prove to be acceptable uh, in your sight. For, Lord, you are my strength, and, Lord, you are indeed my redeemer. And this we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Uh, let us all say together, amen. Wow, September the 1st, man, beginning of the first uh, day of September, and also kicks off a very brand new series for us. This is a Revival Emphasis Month here at GYZ. And part of that Revival Emphasis Month, the theme is going to be this month, is how to have a revival of living in the goodness of God. How do we have a revival of living in the goodness of God? You know, in the midst of everything that's going through in our culture, in our country today, uh, the pandemic and all the things you can think of, man, 2020 has been something. This is the time where Christians have to know how to live and to have that more abundant life. Amen. This is the time where everybody's watching. And Jesus reminds us that we need to let our light so shine that men might see our good works and give the glory of God, which is in heaven. This is the time, man, when our walk has got to match up with our talk. You know, we talk a good game, uh, but the world is watching and they're watching and seeing. Do we really, we really believe the things that we actually, actually say? You know, and, and what about living in the goodness of God? Because, you know, you talk to people all the time. And what are the, one of the key phrases that people always say, God is good. And then people say all the time. And they say all the time, God is really good. And it really kind of, you know, wonders sometimes by the way we act and the way we go and the, and the attitudes that we have. Do we really believe that God is good all the time? I mean, is he good doing pain? Do we consider God being good when we're going through conflicts? Do we consider God being good when we're going through a crisis in our life? Do we say that God is being good when we're worried or when we're stressed out or when we're disappointed? And so these are the things that people say, oh, man, God is good, God is good, God is good, God is good. You know, but are you living in the goodness of God? Now, does the Bible say God is good? Of course it does. Of course it does. Psalm 105. And Psalm 105, this is what the psalmist said. For the Lord is good. And he said his mercy is what? It's everlasting. And guess what? Everlasting means it never ends. It lasts forever. And his truth what? will endure what? To all generations. No matter what crisis, coronavirus, no matter what we're going through, all of these di different things, you know, the word of God, God is still is going to be good. He's going to be good through all of the things that we're going through in our life and all of the things that we have. The question is, are you living in the goodness of, what? of God? Amen. We're going to be taking another look at Psalm 23. And what even the psalmist reminds us that surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. Now, how do you, how do you actually live in the goodness of God? Well, this is one thing you have to live in. It worship allows you to do that. Psalm 34 and 9. Psalm 34 and 9. Amen. And Psalm 34 uh, and verse number 9, uh, and, and this is what the Bible said. Oh, fear the Lord, ye saints. The word fear in the Bible is to reverence God. It is an act of worship. The worship, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we fear the Lord, we worship him, we reverence him. For there is no want to them what? That what? That fear him. So worship is how you live in the goodness what? Of God. Your focus is on him. This is how you live in the goodness of God. It helps us to be able to experience God's goodness. Amen. The question is that why then of all the stuff we're talking about, rejoicing the Lord always and again, and I say rejoice, amen, and that God is so good all the time and that God's mercy is everlasting, that truth will do it through all generations. And why in the world we are the Christians who are living in so much doubt or who are living in so much discouragement or are living in so much defeat? Are living themselves and they're stressed out. Amen. What happens when a believer forgets to live in the goodness of God? And that's what happens, man. We just forget it. We forget that, you know, that we need to live in the goodness of God. And so God is good. And you know, God doesn't change. I mean, his mercy is everlasting. His truth can do it through all generations. So if I'm going through depressions and devout and discouragement and the things and the attitudes and stuff that I'm going through, if somehow I have forgotten to live in the goodness of God. So we're going to take this today and we're going to take tomorrow to finish this up. This is part one on today. Let me give you four things and I'm going to be out of your way today. How do we forget to live in the goodness of God? There are four things that happen to us 
when we when we forget to live in the goodness of God. Here's number one. We please write this down. When you claim credit for things that God has done in your life. When you claim credit for things that God has done in your life. And I mean, just think about it. Everything, everything that we have, because God gave it to us. Everything that we, 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 we nobody owns anything. The Bible said what? The earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof. Everything that dwells therein, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. The silver is mine, the gold is mine. Throughout the Bible, man. You know, but which, somehow we, let, we try to live in a way that we take the credit for what only God can do for us in our life. And that's when we lose sight of his goodness. We don't experience the fact of his goodness because we're so busy patting ourselves on the back or so busy uh, t talking about how smart we are or so busy elevating ourselves or uh, being able to talk about how many degrees we got or how much training we got or how many titles that we're living under. We live outside of the credit of God. The only thing, this is where your stress is coming from. This is where your frustration is coming from. This is where all the doubt and stuff in your life is really coming from. This is where your misery is coming from. Even though you claim that God says he'll never leave you, nor would he ever forsake you. But let me caution you about this. When you claim credit for God, you bring God's judgment on you. You bring a quick judgment from God. And let me give you some scriptures in the Bible that I want you to kind of focus on. Uh, that the Bible proves that point. Luke 16, excuse me, Luke 12 and verse number 16. Luke 12 and verse number 16. Listen to what Jesus says. And he spake a parable unto them, saying that the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And verse 13, this he says, and he thought within himself, what shall I do, man? I got all this stuff that I have because I have no room wherein to restore my fruits. And he said, this will I do. Watch this now. I will pull down my barns and I will build greater. And here will I bestow all my fruits and all of my goods. Amen. And then I will say to my soul, listen, I take credit for this. So thou has much goods you've laid up for many years. Hey, hey, take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And look at verse number 20. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Why are you going to take credit for something that I've done for you? God says, I'm killing you tonight. I'm killing you tonight. And listen, let me give you another. Acts 12. And Acts 12 and verse number 21. And this is about Herod the king. And they said, upon a set day, Herod arrayed himself in royal apparel and set upon his throne and made an oration, gave this great speech unto them. And go to verse number 22. And the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. And look at verse 23. And the Bible says, and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eating of worms and he gave up the ghost. That means God killed him. He killed him, amen? And then you look at Romans 1. Some of that born you today. And Romans 1, you remember the Bible says that everything, we know there's a God by natural creation. What do you mean by natural creation? It means that we didn't make the sun, we didn't make the moon, we didn't make the stars. There's so many things that we didn't do. So we know there has to be a God that made these things happen. But look at Romans 1, 21. Because they, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. They didn't give him credit. Neither were they thankful because vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkening. Amen. Professing themselves what? To be wise, they became fools. You know, this is what God is saying. And you know what? In the end, the Bible said God gave them over to a reprobated mind. A reprobated mind is a mind that's not sane. They're not sane. They're not sensible. Uh, this type of mind, and they began to what to do all kinds of stuff. The birth of homosexuality, where men uh, began to burn in their lust toward other men, and women began to burn in their lust toward other women. God does not play, man. When you don't give God credit for what He does, He does not play. Amen. Second Timothy three two. Paul Paul was reminded that at the end of the day, what's going to happen? For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Uh, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedience to parents, there it is, unfaithful and unholy. Amen? 
And all of these things, man, should not be. It should not be. Why? Because James 1.17, the Bible says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. It comes from God. He is the Father of lights. And without him there is no variables, neither are there shadow of turning. So therefore, you forget to live in the goodness of God when you take credit for what God is doing. Amen? You know, you ought to be able to say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll do this. If it's the Lord's will, we'll do this. God, we want to thank you for this. We want to thank you for this. And the Bible said what? In everything, you need to be given what? Thanks to God. Because this is the will of God. Everything comes directly from him. So what? We forget the goodness of God when we fail to tell God, thank you. Here's number two. You forget the goodness of God when you stop asking God for help. When you stop asking him for help. Amen? It is amazing, man, how much we go through in our life. Do we ever stop and ask God, will you help me with this? You know, the scripture says in all your ways you need to acknowledge him. You know, God, I need a house. Did you ask God to help you with that? You know, God, I need help with my children. Did you ask God to help you with that? You know, that's why the hymn writer said, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Then he said, oh, what peace we often forfeit. And oh, what needless pain we bear. Why? It's all because what you do not carry. What? Everything to God in prayer. God expects us to ask him. Why? Because we want whatever we get to represent him. To represent what he's doing in our lives. Why? Because that's important to build what we call trust. In Matthew 7 and 7, listen to what the Bible says. It says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And so God said, I'm expecting you. And here's a lot of things. I mean, you're going through all this stress. You're going through all these troubles. You're going through all these struggles. And you have not taken the time to ask me for my help. And because of that, guess what? You don't trust me. You don't trust me. And the Bible said, hey, trust in the Lord with all your heart. But you cannot trust God if you do not depend on him. You know, you can't trust anybody in a relationship if you don't depend on them. You don't ask them to meet the need. How are you going to be a trust? You know, it's called a, a, it's, it's called a circle of security. It's something you learn as a child. How do children be a trust in their parents? You know, number one, this is called a circle of security, and you have to do the same thing with God. The first thing you've got to do to build a circle of security is that you've got to recognize that you have a need. You got to recognize that you have a need. God, you know what? I need you to help me. I got a need. You know, I can't do this on my own. Even if I could, it would not represent you. So you got to recognize that you have a need. So when a child builds trust in his parents, you know what? The child recognizes he has a need. And so guess what happened? When he recognizes he has a need, the second thing he does is that he asks, he expresses that need. His expressed that need. When a child recognizes I'm hungry or recognizes my diaper is dirty, amen, the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to start hollering. I'm going to start screaming. I'm going to make sure that my parents understand uh, this because, well, <laughs> hey, man, I, I got a need. I need you to change this diaper. Or I need you to go ahead and get me something to eat. So you got to recognize your need first. Then the second thing you got to do, you got to what? You got to express that need. And then the third thing you got to do, you got to rely on God to meet that need. That's how you build trust. That's how you build trust. And then the circle goes around and around and around and around and around in their life. So a lot of people don't know how to trust God because they don't go through what is called a circle of security. They don't go through the circle of security by recognizing, hey, man, I got a need in my life. Number two, God, hey, I need you to help me with this. And then three, I'm willing to wait on you to provide it for me. You know, and the reason why I want to wait on you, Lord, because that's how I learned how to trust you. If you give it to me immediately, it only it brings insecurity in me, it brings what? It brings selfishness in me, it brings self-sufficiency. But when I'm able to wait on it, and able to wait on you, then it builds trust in you. And so this is the second reason why we don't live in the goodness of God. We forget about stopping and asking God to really help us. Amen? And here's number three. Here's number three. It's when you don't trust God in difficult times. You don't trust God in difficult times. Amen? 
And here's the thing that I had to learn a long time ago, is that when you're going through difficult times in your life, go to God first. Go to him first, man. We go to everybody else but God. We go to everybody else. Maybe I need to read a book on this. Maybe I need to read a book on this. Or maybe I need to call my cousin. Maybe I need to call my auntie. Or maybe I need to call Pastor Blunt. You know, no, 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 no. You know, you need to call the Lord first. You need to call the Lord first. You need to acknowledge him first. Uh, now, there's some scriptures I want you to write down. Psalm 16, 1 and 2. Listen to what listen to the psalmist said. He said, preserve me, O God, for it is in you do I put my trust. You know, I don't care what I'm going through, Lord. I'm putting my trust in you. Verse number 2. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord. My goodness extended what? Not to you. Amen? You know, don't let that happen to believe that God can bless everybody else but you. You know what? That God can what? God can help everybody else do this with you. Amen? Uh, the hymn writer used to say, there is no secret what God should do. What he's done for others, he'll do the same thing for you. And so you got to believe that it will extend it to you. I don't care what is going on in my life, the sickness or suffering or whatever happened. I believe in my heart that there is nothing going on in my life that God cannot handle. And so therefore, in the midst of what is impossible for me, it is possible with him. Psalmist said it real. Romans 5, verse number 3. And not only so do we glory in tribulations, amen? We glory in tribulations. We glory... What do we mean by glory? Glory simply means that God is going to show us how he's going to do things. God's going to show us how he's going to fix it. You know, tribulations come in our lives when there's trouble that we can't handle. Trouble we can't manage. You know, trouble that's beyond our control. You know, but you know what? You know what? Watch what God would do. I know that the trouble in my life is going to work patience. And what it means, it's going to work endurance. The more I can go through things, the more things I can go through. You know, the, whatever God is taking me through now is preparing me for something greater. He's getting ready to take me through. And you know what? The greater the burden, the greater the blessing. The greater that God puts on you, the greater great things are going to come your way. Amen. And here's verse number four. In verse number four. And then this endurance, man. That we have with God. It's going to give us experience. We learn to experience him. And in that way man. We're not sitting around hoboing on nobody else's anointing. Or hoboing on nobody else's feeling. Or watching around with everybody. Hey man. Because of stuff I've been through. You know. Again the hymn writer said. He said through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. And through it all. I've learned to depend upon his word. And so therefore, this is the experience I have with God. And out of this experience comes my hope. And my hope is based on the fact of his goodness. When my hope is in God, it's because I know how good he is. That I know he will make a way out of no way. That I know he will kill what? care about me. And I know he will see me through no matter what situation in my life. Here's number four, and I get ready to leave you on today. We forget about the goodness of God, man, when we take credit. When we take credit upon ourselves, you know, and I give God to th be thankful and be grateful to him. Hey, man, we forget about the goodness of God. We forget about the goodness of God, man, when we don't stop and ask God for help. And we don't realize, man, that we can't do anything without him. And so therefore, man, man, we don't live in the goodness of God. We forget about the goodness of God when we don't trust God when difficult times come. Amen? Knowing Romans 8, 28, that he said all things will work together for good to those that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. Here's the final thing I'm going to share with you on today and, uh, and about forgetting about living in the goodness of God. When you become pessimistic about your future, when you become pessimistic about your future, you know, I was coming around down in the car on my way here to on today, and Ja'Kalen Carr, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, um, you know, I, I just love that song that she, she sings when she sings the song about God is changing your story. You know, no matter what's going on in my life, guess what, man? I'm trusting God because God is changing my story.
You know, in the midst of this, I could be sick, but guess what? I ain't going to be sick long because God is changing my story. You know, no matter what's going on in my life, it ain't going to last long because God is changing my story. And this is the people who lose their hope, man. When you don't live in the goodness of God, you don't have any hope. Your hope is based upon the fact that the Lord, what? He is good. No matter what is going on in your life, coronavirus, no matter what is happening. Listen to Psalm 27, 13. This is one of my favorite songs, amen. Listen to what the psalmist said. I had fainted. That means I, had, I would have given up. Unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 14. Oh my God. Wait on the Lord. Just wait on him. He may not come when you want him. But he's always on time. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall what? Strengthen your heart. He says I say what? Wait on the Lord. Amen. The final scripture is Jeremiah 29 and verse number 11. And this is what he told them in the midst of their captivity. In the midst of what they were going through uh, in their captivity. God said, don't worry about it. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. He says, it's going to be thoughts of peace and not of evil. And God says, I'm going to give you an expected end. Whatever's going to happen in your life, guess what? It's not by accident. It's going to be by providence. And God is going to make it life. Amen? God is going to make it life. Man, I'm just coming through a heat stroke and coming through some health issues myself. And guess what? Hey, I'm here today. I'm teaching you on today. God's will, I'll be here tomorrow. And let me tell you, you know why? Because God is changing my story. You know, last week I was sick. Last week I was down. I'm up today because God keeps changing my story. And that's what you need to praise God for and lift up God for tomorrow. Now tomorrow, we're going to be talking about part two of how to live when you forget the goodness of God. We're going to talk about what it means to live in the goodness of God. What it means to live in the goodness of God. So you got to get in here tomorrow, man, at 12 noon. And you got to get this word because this is going to really help liberate you and move you along. I refuse to live in doubt. I refuse to live in discouragement. I refuse to live in defeat. I refuse to live in depression. I don't have to live that way. The goodness of God will follow me all the days of my life. And I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord. What? I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So guess what? We're going to see you on tomorrow. And we're going to be doing it. And then this coming Sunday, we're going to remind you of the parking lot community. And we're excited about that. And I'm going to be talking about how you live in the anointing of God. How do you live? Man, you're going to live in the How do you live? People say, I'm anointed. Well, how do you live in that anointing? And we're going to show you that on Sunday, man, on Sunday morning, man, at uh, 730. Uh, parking lot community, we want you to keep that in mind. All right, well, we want to remind you again as we continue to pray for this pandemic. Pray for those who are going through this pandemic. Pray for uh, those people who are struggling in the pandemic. Pray for those who have lost loved ones in the midst of all of this as, as well. Pray for our leaders, our national, local, our state leaders. Pray for our medical personnel. You know, for, we want to pray for them. We want to pray for our doctors and nurses and medicine and all the people who are risking their lives, man, to save our lives. Pray for our first responders. You know, our, our fire people, our police, and different other people who have to respond in the midst of not only this coronavirus, but all the other tragedies and things that are happening are within us, within our culture on today. We continue to lift them up on today. We want to remind you again that this is the time that you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. If you have not done that, hey, you need to know that God is not willing that anybody should perish, but everybody should come into the knowledge of him. And every time we need the Lord, Hey, we need him right now. Greater your Zion want to make sure that you know about Jesus Christ. And that there's no reason in the world that no one would take the time out to minister to you and explain Christ to you. Let's call our church number 706-724-1720. We have one of our ministers get back with you. Leave a message and we'll be happy to take the time out to not only pray with you about this, but to pray for you 
uh, as well. And if you don't have a church home, to connect you to the Grady and Zion family uh, as well. Amen. God bless you and may God keep you as our prayer. God, we want to thank you again for another broadcast. I want to thank you again for this word. And we ask it, oh God, that you would bless this entire series for the entire month as we continue, Lord, to revive our spirits and live in your goodness. Continue to bless us now and keep us, God, as our prayer. God, we give you the glory right now. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in today. A CD of today's message can be mailed to you for just $7. Please call the church office at 706-724-1720 and reference today's date or sermon title when placing your order. If you would like to become a member of our church or are in need of prayer, call the church office at 706-724-1720 or join our prayer call. The information is listed on the screen. GYZ is a Bible teaching church seeking, reaching, and teaching all to live for Christ. We invite you to tune in again for our regular broadcasts, Tuesdays at 10.30 a.m., Wednesdays at noon, and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. You can also follow us on social media at GYZ Augusta. Please be sure to like our pages and even share them with a friend. If this program has been a blessing to you, please consider giving to our ministry. We have many ways to give, including online through the Give Plus app, our church website at gradyyoungzion.org, or you can give easily via cash app. Just type in G-Y-Z-A-U-G. Don't miss another dynamic sermon series led by our own Pastor William B. Blunt, starting next week, The Keys to a Well-Lived Life. Invite a friend to tune in and be blessed by this teaching. Until we meet again, we pray you have a blessed week. May the Lord continue to cover your families with his hedge of protection and grant you peace in the midst of this pandemic.